Welcome to the Graduate Financial Education Program presentation on employee benefits. My name is Kristen Short and I'm a PhD student in financial planning. And my assistantship is with the Graduate Financial Education Program in the Graduate School. And the whole purpose of this program is to bring financial education to graduate students to help increase financial knowledge and help reduce stress that students are feeling around finances. So we know that graduate students are experiencing a lot of stress. The research shows that. And one of those major stresses is stress around finances. So the whole hope with this program is just to provide that free financial education to help reduce the stress that students are feeling so that they can focus better on their studies and progress through the completion of their degrees. So today we're gonna to talk about employee benefits and this is gonna be particularly helpful for those of you who are maybe nearing the end of your graduate school journey and are considering multiple job offers and want to kind of know how to go about selecting the benefits offered to you at your first job. So why should you pay attention to employee benefits? Well, first of all, employee benefits are considered part of your compensation package. So when you're comparing multiple job offers, you may think, oh, I should, you know, financially speaking, take whatever offer has the higher salary. But that's not necessarily the case because financially speaking, the salary is not the only part of your compensation, right? The benefits offered to you through employee benefits are also part of your compensation. So if one job has a slightly lower salary, but they have employee match on the retirement plan, or they offer a match to a health savings account, or they give you free parking or a free meal plan, then all of these extra benefits could actually mean that the lower salary job overall provides you better compensation. So it's important to take into consideration employee benefits when considering the financial differences between multiple job offers. Not only that, but employee benefits impact various aspects of your financial life. So retirement savings, healthcare plans, childcare and dependent care, insurance, wellness, consumer discounts, all of these different aspects are included in your employee benefits package and so it's important to pay attention to because that's a lot of different areas of your financial life that are impacted by those decisions that you make in the first week or month of being on the job and then finally employee benefits are important because they can help you shelter your income from taxes so i'm not talking about tax evasion i'm just talking about ways that you are legally able to help reduce your taxes by putting your finances or putting your paycheck into tax advantaged accounts such as tax advantaged retirement accounts or health savings accounts and utilizing those resources can help reduce the amount of taxes that you're paying on your income so paying attention and understanding employee benefits can help reduce the amount of tax liability you have from year to year so first, let's just go over a few terms that are likely to come up when you're looking through the retirement section of your employee benefits package. So first, employer match. An employer match is when the employer contributes a certain amount of money to a savings plan based on the amount of the employee's contribution. All right, so it's not necessarily just free money from the employer. It's money that you get from the employer under the condition that you contribute or make a commitment to save money from your paycheck. So the contract might say something like, the employer will match 50% of the employee's contributions up to 6% of their salary. So the way this would work is, let's say you earn $100,000 just to make the number simple, and you save $6,000 of your salary or 6% of your salary toward a retirement account. Your employer would match that $6,000 up to 50%. So the most that you would get from your employer would be $3,000. So you contribute $6,000, they match it up to $3,000, you have a total of $9,000 in your retirement account. Now, if you only contribute 3% of your salary, so $3,000, your employer is still only going to match 50% of that. So your employer is going to put in $1,500 into the account, right? So they only contribute 50% or 50 cents for every dollar that you put in. Now, if you were to contribute 10% of your salary, 
you know, the, the employer is not going to contribute 50% of that $10,000 because their 50% contribution is capped at 6% of your salary, right? So even if you contribute $10,000 or 10% of your salary, the maximum they'll do is still just 50% of 6%, so that $3,000. All right, and then there's something called vesting. And in my opinion, this is one of the most important things to understand about your retirement savings. And vesting, there's kind of a few different ways you can think about the definition, so I'll give you multiple ways you can think about it. But vesting is basically the portion of the employer's contributions in your account that you are entitled to, that are totally in your possession. If you were to leave the company, you would be able to keep that percentage or that portion of the employer's contributions. Or another way you can think about it is the amount of time required to lapse before you actually receive entitlement or receive a benefit from your, your retirement plan. So whenever you're making contributions into a retirement account, any contributions that come out of your paycheck, you are completely entitled to. If you were to leave the company, you would walk away with all that money. But if your employer is matching into the account or contributing into the account, you wouldn't necessarily get to walk away with that money if you left the company unless you were vested in that money. So there's three types of vesting schedules, immediate, graded, or cliff. And immediate means that as soon as you start working at the company and as soon as you start participating in the retirement plan and as soon as the money comes from the employer into the retirement savings account, it's 100% yours. You are completely entitled to it. And if you were to leave the company, you would keep everything the employers put in. Graded, which is demonstrated on the left column of this chart, would be something like this progressive percentage or entitlement to the fund. So let's say year one, you're 0% vested. That means that if your employer contributes to the retirement account and you quit, you leave the company, you lose all of the money that your employer contributed to the account. If you work through year two and you leave in year two, you'd walk away with only 20% of whatever the employer has contributed to the account. Year three, 40% of what the employer has contributed. Year four, 60%. And 80%, you wouldn't actually have 100% entitlement to the employer's contributions until you've worked at the company for six years. So that's a graded vesting schedule. Cliff vesting is even more difficult to gain full entitlement to the employer contributions. So the way cliff vesting works is in the first few years, and it just depends on the employer and what's stated in their contract, but in this example, let's say the first four years, you have 0% entitlement to the funds contributed by your employer. So if you left at any point in time in the first four years, anything the employer had contributed to your account would just go away. You wouldn't get to keep it. And it's not until your year five that you become vested in the account. And at that point, you gain 100% entitlement to the funds or 100% vesting. So this is really, really important to pay attention to because you want to make sure that you work at the company long enough to be 100% vested. And if the vesting schedule is, you know, six years graded or five years cliff, and you only intend to work at your first entry level position for maybe two years, then that's an important thing to know if you're going to lose entitlement to all the employer contributions going into your retirement account. All right, so then another term related to retirement that you want to understand is the distribution or the benefits. So that just is referring to once you're actually in retirement and you start taking money out of a retirement account, that's considered a distribution. Or if you're in like a pension plan, which we'll talk about in a few slides, then the pension payment that you receive each month is considered the benefit. So a distribution or a benefit is just a disbursement or payout of funds from a retirement account and typically during retirement. Okay, so let's talk about retirement plans. So there's generally two umbrellas of retirement plans, defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans. So a defined benefit plan is a plan where the employer guarantees that the employee receives a benefit upon retirement, regardless of the performance of the investment pool. 
So the way this works, or what this means, is that throughout the time you work for the employer, every paycheck, you contribute money into this big retirement plan bucket that belongs to the employer, right? They kind of collect the money from all their employees. They invest it in the stock market or the bond market or however they want to invest it. They're responsible for making the investment pool grow and perform well and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just put money into it month after month after month. And then once you reach retirement, you receive a consistent amount of money each year from the employer, right? So the money would actually come to you on a monthly basis. It'd be like a monthly paycheck, even though you're not working anymore. That's that benefit I referred to in the previous slide. So every month you'd get a benefit, the exact same amount. Each year it would probably go up a little bit just to adjust for inflation, but it's not like you have access to that big pot of money that the employer's holding. It's, it's not like you have an account with your name on it. Instead, you're just entitled to a payout from the big employer bucket. And this is typically referred to as a pension plan. Now, a defined contribution plan is a little bit different. So this is a plan where the final benefit received by the employee depends on the plan's investment performance. So in this case, each year or each paycheck, you're contributing a little bit of money to a retirement account. And each year it kind of grows a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, all the way until you get to retirement. And the way that this money grows over time is that you have to actually go into your account and invest it, you know, pick stocks and bonds and mutual funds and index funds and all that kind of stuff. You are responsible for the investment of that money and you're responsible for the way it performs. And if you just leave it in cash for your whole working life, it's not gonna grow very much. And if you invest it well and strategically, then it will grow over time. And then in retirement, you'll just have this big amount of money that you have access to. And if you wanted to, you could take all of it out in year one, which I don't recommend, but you could decide in year one, you want to take a small amount from it. In year two, you want to take a big amount from it. And you have total discretion about the way in which you dwindle down that pot of money. So the typical defined contribution plans would be things like your 401k, 403b, 457b. So let's just talk a little bit more about pension plans. First of all, how are pension plans calculated? So whenever you reach retirement, like I mentioned on the previous slide, you would receive a fixed monthly benefit from the employer. And the way that that benefit amount is calculated just depends on the employer. Sometimes it's a calculation of the average of your final earnings, like in the last few years of working for the employer. Sometimes it's based on some formula that takes into consideration the average of your earnings throughout your entire career working for that employer. Sometimes it's just a flat benefit based on how long you've worked for that employer. So it would this calculation or this formula should be detailed in the employee benefits package. And you could kind of look up to see how the benefit is calculated. So the advantages of a pension plan is that it provides that predictable income during retirement all the way until you die. You get that same fixed monthly payment, usually increases for inflation, but you're confident that you're gonna get that money every month until the end of life. Another advantage is that the investment risk is on the employer, not the employee. So you don't have to worry about investing the funds. The employer takes that on completely and is responsible for that investment. The disadvantages of a pension plan is that you don't have that investment control. So a lot of times you might be able to invest the funds better or have a portfolio allocation that most closely aligns with your risk tolerance and you don't have to depend on the employer to do a good job with the investment. So sometimes you could actually do better on your own getting to, the, getting to invest the money yourself. Two, there's no early access to the funds. So if you decide to retire early and you have a defined contribution plan, then you know, those funds are yours and you have access to them. And if you wanted to, you could take some out early. There might be penalties involved, but there's also ways you can start taking funds out early without penalties being involved. And so you can kind of get that early access 
whereas a pension plan, there's no early access. You just have to fulfill the requirements in order to get the benefit. And then if you don't fulfill the requirements to, the ben to get the benefit, then you could lose the value of everything you've contributed to that plan. For example, at the University of Georgia, their pension plan, TRS, has a 10-year cliff vesting schedule. So if you don't fulfill 10 years of employment at the university, then you lose access to your benefit. And then another disadvantage of pension plans is that it depends on the financial survival of the company. So if you're working for a small company that ends up going under between now and the time that you retire, then all of a sudden you no longer have access to a pension because they can't pay you a pension. But if you work for a company that's been longstanding or you know, public university that's been around forever, then you can be pretty confident that you're gonna receive a, a benefit in retirement. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of those contribution plans. So 401k plans. 401k plans are plans offered by employers where you can contribute your own money into the account. And sometimes the employer offers a match and then you invest that money in the account however you want to invest it. And typically there's two type of tax treatments that you can opt into for a 401k account. You can either pick the traditional tax treatment or the Roth tax treatment. So the only difference between those two is when you pay taxes on the money. And then the limit for a 401k is $19,000. And that limit kind of increases each year. So just looking at the difference between a 401k traditional versus Roth, with a traditional 401k, any contributions that you make to the 401k are considered pre-tax. So you get a deduction on your taxes for that contribution. Whereas with a Roth 401k, you don't get any kind of tax deduction for making contributions. So it's essentially like you're putting post-tax dollars into the 401k account. And then for either a traditional or a Roth, an employer may offer a match contribution. And for either a traditional or a Roth, the con contributions in the account can be invested and grow over time with no tax implications until retirement. And then once you get to retirement, any funds that you take from a traditional 401k are taxed as income because when you first put the money in, you got a tax deduction. So you've got a tax benefit on the front end. Then when you take them out on the back end, you have to pay taxes on that money. Whereas with a Roth 401k, when you take out money in retirement, you don't have to pay taxes on it, so it's completely tax-free. And that's because on the front end, when you put the money in, you didn't get a deduction, so you didn't get any kind of tax benefit. So the Roth tax benefit comes on the back end when you're taking the money out. 403B plans. 403B plans are essentially the same as a 401k. The only difference is the entity that's offering it. So if you work for a nonprofit or a government employer, then they're likely going to have a 403B rather than a 401k. And that's just because of the entity that they are. So the rules are virtually identical. So there could be a traditional 403B and a Roth 403B same rules as the 401k, same contribution limit as a 401k. So if your employer were to offer both a 401k and a 403b, which is not likely because again, it just kind of depends on the, the classification of the company, whether or not they offer the 401k versus the 403b. But if for some reason your employer offered both, then you could technically have both of those accounts if you wanted to but the maximum you could contribute across all accounts is $19,000. So probably a more likely circumstance would not be that the same employer is offering both plans, but let's say you work for two different employers and one of those employers is offering a 401k and one of those employers is offering a 403b. You could have a 401k with the one employer and a 403b with the other employer, but between the two accounts, the maximum amount you could contribute is still that $19,000. So you could split it 10,000 and 9,000, you could split it 16,000 and 3,000 or whatever, but you could not do 19,000 into one and 19,000 into the other. And then there's something called the 457B. And again, the rules with this are very similar to the 401k and the 403b. There's traditional and Roth treatments, the limit is $19,000. 
But the difference is the 457B is kind of like an additional layer in, in addition to the 401k or 403b. So you could have all of the accounts and you can contribute 19,000 to the 401k or 403b combined, but then you could contribute an additional $19,000 to the 457b. So if you have either a 401k or a 403b and you're totally maxing it out, you're putting in that $19,000 and you still have money that you want to get into tax advantage savings accounts, that's when you would open the 457B to try and get more money in and you'd have that additional $19,000 limit on the 457B. So think about it kind of like this fountain. So um, the first bucket that you fill up is either the 401K or the 43B. And then when you, once you've maxed out that bucket and you have extra that you want to save, then you kind of open the 457B and the overflow gets started to pile up in that 457B up to $19,000. So just to kind of wrap up this retirement section of the employee benefits, whenever you're looking at this section, here's a few questions that you should ask to make sure that you're considering all the implications of the retirement benefits. First, you always wanna ask if there's a match. And if there's a match, how can you maximize the amount of money that your employer is gonna put into the plan? So you always wanna to try to contribute at least as much as is required to maximize the employer's contribution. So back to that example we had before, the employer matches 50% up to 6% of your salary. You would wanna make sure you at least contribute 6% to your account so that you can maximize the amount the employer is willing to match. Then you wanna ask what the vesting schedule is, figure out how long it would take you to be 100% vested. So like I said before, at the University of Georgia, one of their retirement plans has a 10 year cliff vesting schedule. So you have to work in the University System of Georgia for 10 years before you're entitled to a benefit. Whereas their alternate plan, the ORP, has immediate vesting. So as soon as you start working for the university and making contributions and the employers making contributions, if you were to leave the university, you would walk away with all that money. So it's really important to understand that vesting when you're picking between different retirement plans offered by your employer. And then you wanna know if your contributions to the account are taxed now or taxed later. So that's basically, is there a Roth option? Is there a traditional option? And if there's not an option, which of the two treatments is the mandatory option? So you just wanna know what kind of tax situation it is. And if you have access to both, the way you would decide whether to pick the traditional or the Roth is basically thinking what your tax bracket is and you wanna have the tax advantage or you wanna avoid the tax whenever your tax bracket is the highest. So you think, will I have to pay less in taxes now or in retirement? If you're in the 22% tax bracket now and you think you're gonna be in the 12 tax bracket when you're in retirement, then you wanna take the tax deduction now when you're having to pay 22% taxes, right? So you would opt into the traditional option, get your tax break now, and even though you have to pay taxes in retirement, you only have to pay 12% tax on them. But if you're in the 22% tax bracket now, and you think in retirement, you're gonna be in the 24% tax bracket or the 35% tax bracket, then it would be better to contribute to a Roth, even though you don't get a tax deduction now, later when you're in a higher tax bracket, you'd get to take the money out tax-free. So that's kind of how you would assess whether or not to pick the traditional or the Roth. But if you're not sure how your tax bracket will differ in retirement, then you could try diversifying. So you could put half the funds in a traditional, half the funds in a Roth. And then you wanna ask what the contribution limit is on the account. So again, I was talking about that $19,000 number, but that's only for 2019. So each year that number is gonna change and you wanna make sure to stay up to date on what that number is in case you're trying to max out the contributions. Then some companies have investment support. And so you might have access to a free financial advisor. And that's an important question to ask when you're thinking about the different retirement options. And then finally, you wanna ask how long do you have to decide which retirement plan you choose? And once you choose that retirement plan, are you allowed to change your mind in the future? Okay, so if you're just opting into a 401k, you know, you can select to max out your contributions this year, 
But then next year, if you don't want to max out your contributions, you can easily change the amount you're contributing to the account. Other times, like if you're selecting between two mandatory retirement plans in the University System of Georgia, the TRS or the ORP, once you make your decision between those two plans, you can never change your mind, right? So it's really important to know when you're making these decisions, how flexible is the decision? And once you pick a plan, are you able to change it later down the road? So let's transition to health insurance. And first, we're just going to cover some common terms in health insurance. And honestly, a lot of understanding health insurance comes from understanding the terms because there are so many different terms and they're pretty confusing and they sound similar. So if you can really grasp onto the meaning of these definitions, then it will really help you as you consider different health insurance options and kind of read through the health insurance section of your employee benefits package. So the first term is the premium. And the premium is the amount that you pay each month just to have health insurance, right? So you'll be billed that amount monthly. It will come out of your paycheck. Even if you never go to the doctor the whole year, you still have to pay that premium. It's just the baseline amount that you have to pay just to have health insurance. Then there's something called a copayment. And not all health insurance plans use copayments, but a lot of them do. And a copayment is just a flat rate payment that you make when you receive services. So you go to the doctor because you have a sore throat. And instead of paying for the full cost of the appointment to see the doctor and get your throat looked at and all this kind of stuff, you might just have to pay this flat rate payment, copayment of maybe $20 when you go to the doctor. And all you pay is that $20 and then you get access to the appointment, the diagnosis, all that kind of stuff, just for $20. And each time you see the doctor, even if it's you know because you broke your arm and you have to get an x-ray and all that kind of stuff, you still just pay that $20 copayment, right? Some plans, instead of operating on copayments, operate on something called a deductible. And a deductible is the amount you pay for healthcare services before your insurance kicks in. So let's say you go to the doctor for that sore throat. And let's say the cost of seeing that doctor and getting the throat assessed and diagnosed and all that kind of stuff, let's say that whole process costs $300. Well, depending on the amount of your deductible, you will have to pay out of pocket the full cost of that appointment up to your insurance plan deductible amount before your insurance starts helping you pay for that cost. So let's say the deductible on your health insurance was $200. The appointment cost $300. You're going to pay the first $200 of that appointment. And then the remaining $100 of the appointment, you would kind of cost share with your insurance company. If your deductible is $1,000 for the year, and you have that $300 appointment with the doctor, you're just gonna be paying that full $300 out of pocket. And then you still have $700 worth of your deductible left that you'll still have to pay out of pocket for the rest of your healthcare needs that year until you've hit that $1,000 threshold. So most insurance plans will use kind of either a co-payment or a deductible payment structure, but then some insurance companies or insurance plans will use kind of a blend of the two. So for certain types, of services or procedures or office visits, you pay co-payments, and then for other types of procedures, specialists or something like that, then you have to pay a deductible. So it just totally depends on the plan, but those are two different payment structures. And then there's something called coinsurance. And coinsurance is the percentage of healthcare costs you pay after you meet the deductible or for medical expenses not covered by your copay. All right. So Every insurance plan has a premium. And then every insurance plan will have either co-payments or deductibles or both. And then every insurance plan after that layer would have the co-insurance. So let's go back to our example with the $200 deductible and the $300 medical visit expense. So the first $200 you pay out of pocket because you're deductible, then the remaining $100 you split the cost of that $100 with your insurance company, and the way you determine how much of that $100 you pay versus the insurance pays is based on the coinsurance rate. 
So the coinsurance will usually be expressed kind of like a ratio or a fraction. It will say like 80-20 or 70-30 or 60-40 or 90-10 or something. So let's just say the coinsurance was 80-20. That means that the insurance company is going to pay 80% of the cost and you're going to pay 20% of the cost. So that remaining $100 after your deductible, your insurance company pays 80% of it. So they'd pay $80 of it and then you'd pay 20% of it, so you'd pay $20 of it. All right, so after you've met your deductible for the year, any additional healthcare costs that you incur, you split with your insurance company according to the coinsurance rate. Or if you're on a co-payment structure, maybe normal office visits, you pay co-payments, but then if you have a major surgery or something, they're not just gonna make you pay $20 co-payment to get knee replacement surgery. So maybe in that case you have coinsurance or something and they pay 90% of the knee surgery costs and you pay 10%. It just totally depends on the terms of your insurance contract. And then there's something called the out-of-pocket maximum. So the out-of-pocket maximum is the maximum amount that you would pay in one year for healthcare costs. And once you've reached that out-of-pocket maximum, your insurance pays 100% of the costs. All right, so let's say your out-of-pocket maximum was $1,000. Your deductible was $200. That first office visit was $300, so 200 of it was your deductible. Then you started cost-sharing 80-20 with your insurance company, and then you had to go to the doctor again and get an x-ray. And so since you've already met your deductible, you're doing co-insurance, sharing the cost 80-20 with your health insurance company. And then let's say a little bit later, you have to go to the doctor again, and you share those costs 80-20, and eventually, after paying 20% of the healthcare costs of several visits, that amount that you've paid eventually accumulates and adds up to $1,000. Now that you've reached that $1,000 out-of-pocket maximum, any additional visits that you make to the doctor will be paid 100% by the insurance company. So, it's no wonder why so many people are confused about how health insurance works because there's so many layers of payment and cost sharing to cover your healthcare services. So it's really important to understand what payment structure your insurance company uses and what types of services are subject to co-pays versus deductibles versus co-insurance. It's important to understand what your deductible amount is. It's important to understand what your out-of-pocket maximum is. If you have a high a plan with a high deductible, you want to make sure you have access to those funds in an emergency savings account of some sort so that if you do have a major medical expense, you're able to cover the first portion of those medical costs up to your deductible. So it's really important to kind of understand how these different payments work. All right, so the next series of terms don't necessarily relate to payment, but they relate to the type of doctors that you see. So providers are a person or a company that provides healthcare services. And in-network providers are a group of providers who have agreed to work with your insurance company and have agreed to provide a discounted rate of services. So let's say that a knee replacement surgery ordinarily would be billed for $20,000, but the hospital has agreed to only charge your insurance company $15,000 for the knee surgery under the assumption that your insurance company is going to place their hospital in network and they're going to send all of their clients, all their insurance clients to that hospital. So the hospital is willing to bill a lower rate for the surgery because they know they're going to get more clients if they make this agreement with this insurance company. An out-of-network provider is any provider with which your insurance plan has not negotiated a discount rate. So for different health policies, it could be that your health insurance provider will cover costs related to in-network health services. But if you go to an out-of-network doctor, they may not pay a dime of your health care expenses even if you meet the deductible. In fact, the amount that you pay towards those health care expenses won't even count towards your deductible, right? So if you go to an out-of-network doctor and it costs you $300 and you pay those $300 out of pocket, you're still at zero 
on your $200 deductible. Like none of it has even counted towards your deductible because your health insurance is basically saying like, this is not even registering on our radar because you went to an out of network doctor and we don't care. We don't cover anything for out of network visits and we don't count anything that you pay to out of network visits toward your deductible or your out of pocket max or anything like that. So you have to be really aware of how your insurance company treats out of network providers. Now, some insurance providers will pay a certain amount for out of network visits. It's just less than what they would pay for in network visits. All right, so there's three main types of health insurance, health maintenance organizations or HMOs, preferred provider organizations or PPOs, and then a high deductible health plan or an HDHP. And these are just a variety of you know, health insurance providers out there. And it's just important to note that any one of these different providers may have an HMO plan, a PPO plan, and an HDHP plan. So let's talk a little bit about the HMO. And whenever you see HMO, I want you to think home, right? So the letters kind of are the same letters that would be used in the word home. So HMO home. And the reason why I want you to think home is because HMOs want you to stay close to home. And by that, I mean, they want you to stay in the network. They have a specific group of physicians that they've contracted with and the costs are only covered if you visit those in-network providers, okay? So if you go out of network and you have an HMO health plan, your costs are not going to be covered at all. You're gonna be paying completely out of pocket. With HMOs, you typically have low co-payments. Sometimes you don't even have a deductible on the plan. So as long as you're visiting that in-network provider, you're just paying you know, $15, $20 each time you see the doctor, and that's all you have to pay. The rest is covered by the insurance company. One big distinction with HMOs is that you have to get primary care physician referral in order to see specialists. So if you're someone who sees a specialist a lot, this could be pretty inconvenient. If every time you want to see a different specialist, you're having to go back to your primary care physician. But if you don't see specialists a lot, then this may not matter to you and it may not bother you that you have to get that referral. So there's a little less flexibility with HMOs because you have to stay in network, you have to go to your primary care physician, to see a specialist, so there's it's a little more constrained, but then it could also be financially the best way to reduce your costs around healthcare. If, say, for example, the HMO has a lower premium, and then you're only making co-payments whenever you see the doctor. Then a PPO, remember P is for preferred. So the big difference here is that you have the flexibility to choose whether you see in-network or out-of-network providers. And the out-of-network costs are going to be higher, so the insurance company may not cover as much of the costs as they would if you see an in-network provider, but the point is that they will cover some of those costs, whereas with the HMO, none of those costs will be covered at all. Sometimes PPOs have co-payments, but they typically operate on deductibles. And then with PPOs, you can have consultations with specialists without a referral from a primary care physician. So this plan just usually offers a little more flexibility because you can pick whatever doctor you want. And then if you wanna see a specialist, you can just call up the specialist right away and you don't have to have any kind of referral. Then an HDHP or high deductible health plan could be set up like a PPO or an HMO, but the big distinguishing difference with an HDHP is that they have a high deductible, right? And when accepting this high deductible health plan, it usually means that you're accepting more of the risk of healthcare expenses. So as a result, the premiums on that plan are gonna be lower. So sometimes the premiums that you pay on a monthly basis for an HDHP could be maybe 50% of the costs that you'd pay on a monthly basis for a PPO or an HMO. So the, the big advantage there is that lower monthly premium but then also it allows you to qualify for a health savings account, which we'll talk about in a second. So it gives you some pretty big financial advantages, but then because of that high deductible, you would only really want to enroll in a high deductible health plan if you think you're not gonna have a lot of health expenses, because if you do end up having a major health expense, then you're gonna be paying for a lot of it out of pocket because of that high deductible. 
So health savings accounts, here's how they work. First, you get to make pre-tax contributions into the account, which lowers your AGI or your adjusted gross income. Then a lot of times there's some sort of employer match. So you get free money into the account. Third, the funds in the account can be invested tax-free. And then four, you can use the funds for health-related costs tax-free. So why is this such a good deal? The reason is because HSAs are the only investment vehicle with triple tax advantage. You have pre-tax contributions into the account, you have tax-free growth while the money's in the account, and you have tax-free distributions when you take the money out of the account. There is no other account like this, right? Even with a traditional retirement account, you get that pre-tax contribution, you get the tax-free growth, but then you have to pay taxes on the back end. Or with a Roth investment account, you don't get any kind of tax deduction on the front end, you get the tax-free growth and you get the tax-free distribution, right? But you didn't get any discount on the front end. The HSA, you get the pre-tax contributions, tax-free growth, tax-free distributions, triple tax advantage. The important caveat here is that the only way you can use the money tax-free is when you use it for health-related costs. So the whole purpose of this account is just to help put aside money so that when you have major health expenses, you can pay for those health expenses with pre-tax money and not have to ever pay taxes on that money. But then also, if you don't end up having any healthcare expenses in that year, you can save the money, invest it, accumulate it, and then have access to more money for future health expenses. So this is a really good account for saving for retirement because retirement is a time when you're gonna have probably the majority of your health expenses. So HSAs can kind of double as, as this retirement vehicle because if you, if you start saving into this HSA and then you start investing it, it can really grow a lot over 20, 30, 40 years. And then when you get to retirement, any healthcare costs that you have are gonna be able to be paid with that money completely tax-free. Not only that, but once you reach age 65, you can actually use the funds from an HSA for non-health costs without penalty. You just have to pay tax on it. Okay, so really that kind of turns the HSA essentially into a traditional IRA, right? Because you got the tax deduction on the front end, you can grow it tax-free, and then if you take out the money for non-related health care costs, then you pay tax on the amount. That's the exact same tra tax treatment as a traditional IRA. So this is a really good deal, something you should look into if you think an HDHB health plan could be suitable for you because you don't have a lot of healthcare costs and your employer offers an HSA with a match or something, then you would really want to consider that high deductible health plan so that you can start getting money into a health savings account. So here's just a chart that shows some cost breakdown of these different plans. And this isn't kind of the end all be all price ranking of these different plans because it really depends on the company, on how big the network of providers are. There's a lot of things that can change the cost associated with any of these plans. But just generally speaking, I wanna show how for some plans, they might have the most expensive premiums, but then they might be the cheapest when it comes to the deductible or the out-of-pocket maximum. Or for example, the HDHP, they're gonna have the least expensive premium, but then their deductible is the highest. So there's no single health plan that just across the board has the cheapest premiums, the lowest deductibles, the lowest co-pays, and the lowest out-of-pocket maximum. There's no such thing as that ideal, perfect, cheap health plan. So whenever you decrease the cost in one area, it probably means that you're gonna have higher costs in another area. So you just have to think about the way you think you will use healthcare and whether it's worth having higher premiums so that you can have better access to healthcare more frequently that's not as expensive, or if you wanna minimize the amount you're paying in premiums because you don't think you're gonna utilize healthcare very much, and so it doesn't matter that the deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums are so high, but you just have to think about your situation because there's not just one plan that's always the cheapest or one plan that's always the most expensive. So how to think about which plan is right for you. For an HMO, if you don't see many specialists and don't need referrals often, 
if you don't mind the limitation of seeing only providers in your network, and if you want to pay low premiums but not face a high deductible, then an HMO might be right for you. The PPO, if you want flexibility to go out of network, if you utilize healthcare regularly and want to lower the cost per visit, and if you see specialists a lot, then you might want to enroll in a PPO. And then high deductible health plan, if you're generally healthy and don't have any healthcare costs, and if you have access to funds in case of, a, of an emergency, because of that high deductible, you want to make sure that you have those funds available. So moving on from healthcare plans, but still in the realm of health-related expenses, there's something called a flexible spending account or an FSA. And this is basically a tax advantage savings account for health-related expenses. And the way it works is you pick an annual amount that you want available in the account. So let's say you think you need $2,000 in funds in the account to cover your health expenses for that year. That full $2,000 will be available to you in full at the beginning of the year. And then throughout the year, each paycheck, you make a pre-tax deduction toward paying off that $2,000. So it's kind of like your employer's fronting you the money and then each month you're kind of paying the employer back to have that money in that account. But the reason why they just want you to have the money up front is because your major health expense could happen in the month of January. So if you've only contributed, you know, $200 a month towards the FSA in January, you're only going to have $200 in the account, right? So having it available at the beginning of the year is just a way to make sure that the money's there when your health expense occurs, but you do kind of gradually pay back that amount throughout the year. And then the funds in the account have to be used for health-related expenses, and the funds must be used by the end of the year. So if you don't use that $2,000 during the year, at the end of the year, you're just going to lose that money. And what makes the FSA a good deal? Basically allows participants to pay for health co costs with pre-tax dollars, and by contributing to it, you lower your adjusted gross income, which then helps lower your taxes. And then sometimes employers will make contributions for you or match your contributions, so that's free money. And then there's something called a dependent care FSA, and it's a tax advantage spending account for dependent care expenses. So the way it works is that you have a pretext paycheck deduction to contribute funds, and then those funds can be used for dependent care expenses like daycare, or summer camps, or elderly care, and then the funds must be used by the end of the year. So it has that same kind of use it or lose it that the normal FSA has. So what makes that a good deal? It allows participants to pay for dependent care costs with pre-tax dollars, right? So also lowers your adjusted gross income, you end up paying less in taxes, and you're basically getting a better bang for your buck in paying for those costs with pre-tax dollars rather than post-tax dollars. Some other insurance that might be offered by your employer includes group term life insurance. So that's just insurance used to provide financial resources to financial dependents after the loss of life. And a lot of times employers will have some base level of life insurance that you get just for free that you don't have to pay for. So that's always good just to opt into that. But then you also might be able to add a little bit more insurance coverage if you pay a little bit each of your paychecks. So in general, if you do have financial dependence, then you would want to get life insurance. But I would say it's not always going to be best to purchase that life insurance through your employer simply because if you stop working for the employer, then you're going to lose access to that life insurance plan. And so it would be better to kind of go to the marketplace and get a you know, third party insurance company to buy that, that life insurance through so that regardless of your employment status, you still have that policy. You may also have access to short-term disability insurance and that basically protects an employee from the loss of income if he or she temporarily cannot work due to illness, injury, or accident. So during that short term that you have an illness or an injury or an accident and you can't work, short-term disability insurance would basically kick in and give you a paycheck that isn't the full paycheck that you would normally get, but just a portion of your paycheck to help supplement your income during that time when you're unable to work. Generally speaking, if you have access to emergency funds or family support, or you think 
if you were unable to work for a period of you know one to two months and you could scrape by financially then generally we would not recommend that you get short-term disability insurance but if you have no kind of emergency savings or you don't have family you could rely on in that situation and you need that protection then you would want to go ahead and get the short-term disability insurance through your employer and then there's long-term disability insurance which protects the employee from loss of income if he or she cannot work due to illness injury or accident for a long period of time so generally speaking you would want to enroll in long-term disability insurance just because you never know if you could become disabled that's a risk that any of us could experience and a lot of people don't have emergency savings or family support to sustain them over a long-term disability incident and so you would want to be able to have some of your income replaced and to continue coming in as income in the event that you were disabled long term and then finally you want to pay attention to any fringe benefits offered by your employer so that could include things like educational assistance programs or qualified tuition reduction programs that might include access to a gym or other fitness assistance a meal plan that they might offer any dependent care assistance maybe they have a daycare right there on site that's discounted or free for employees um, you want to pay attention to if they offer any kind of moving expense reimbursement or if they offset the cost of transportation or parking so these are all different ways that you can receive economic benefit or value from your employee benefits package and should be taken into consideration when you're thinking about two different job offers and the financial compensation associated with those offers. So this sums up everything on employee benefits. We talked through retirement, health insurance, others type of insurance, fringe benefits. So these are all things to kind of take into consideration as you're evaluating multiple job offers. And again, it's just important to pay attention to these things because they contribute to your compensation and there can be a big difference between the, the financial value of two different offers simply looking at even just like the employer match on a retirement plan that can be a big chunk of change so it's really important to pay attention to these things and make good educated decisions about the benefits that you opt into so if you have any questions about employee benefits or about the financial education program in general you can send us an email to that email address listed there, gradfineduke at uga.edu. And if you're on campus or near Athens, you're welcome to schedule a visit with the Aspire Clinic, and that's one-on-one -on -one free financial counseling for anyone on campus or in the community to meet with financial counselor.